Throughout the world, many women are exploited and abused. The figure for physical assaults on women are horrendous. In many countries, uh, women are forced into unskilled uh, jobs where they're underpaid and overworked. Sef sex trafficking exists in many countries, including here in the United States of America. And as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, we're very concerned about the sinful treatment of women and girls. And uh, for the Christian, there's certainly no place for chauvinistic and domineering men or men who exploit, men who abuse, and men who demean women. This message is for wives today, but let me just stop for a moment and speak to men. I trust no man here abuses his wife, whether physically or verbally. Our society gives us very little uh, help in gender roles and relationships. So we're going to read from Peter's letter, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, and we're going to learn this morning about the Christian wife. What a difference the gospel makes in our homes and in our relationships. And next week we'll consider uh, the Christian husband. So this is directed to wives. So wives, I want you particularly to be listening and alert. Are you ready for it? Someone said, next week you're going to beat up husbands. I thought, no, I'm going to speak to the wives. They're as sinful as the men, right? First Peter 3, then, verse 1, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, by submitting to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children, if you do good, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Interesting, isn't it? Well, we're going to see from this text, first of all, <clears throat> that wives are to, to display submission uh, to their husbands, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husband. Now, we have to understand uh, the context of submission. Peter, let me remind you, is writing to believers who are suffering for their faith. They're experiencing difficult and unfair circumstances. And in the midst of this injustice, in the midst of their suffering, Peter is repeatedly saying throughout this epistle, they are to display a respectful spirit in all of their relationships and situations. They are to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave a perfect example of one who patiently endured suffering in anticipation of future glory. We have seen that in the closing verses of First Peter chapter 2. In different relationships then, the Christian is to submit, as Paul would say in chapter 2 verse, as Peter would say in chapter 2 verse 13, we are to, to be subject for the Lord's sake. As Christians, we're under the submission of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this submission is worked out in these different relationships. If you don't submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, you're going to have great problem in these different situations and relationships. So here is Peter writing to suffering Christians who, who are, he tells them, and this must have been difficult for them, as sometimes it's difficult for us to submit in very difficult circumstances. So the context as we come into chapter 3 is one of submission. Peter has told us Christians are to submit to the secular government, which may be very unjust. He's done that in chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And then in chapter 2, verses 18 and 19, as we learned, Christian servants 
uh, we would say Christian employees, are to be submissive to their masters, even when their masters are harsh, unfair, and unreasonable. For all of that, he gives us the beautiful, the supreme example of how to act in the midst of unfair suffering as he holds up our Lord Jesus Christ and makes this amazing statement that we saw on Good Friday in chapter 2, verse 21, for Christ also suffered for you. Did you get that? Christ also suffered for you. On the cross, He suffered for you. He took your sins. He was buried, and as we celebrated last week, He rose from the dead and is alive forevermore. And the Christian life begins not by baptism. We rejoice in those who are baptized. But the Christian life begins not by becoming a member of a church or being baptized, but rather a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ who suffered for you, who was buried, and who rose again and calls us to receive Him as our Savior and to bow before Him as Lord. How wonderful. Now we will see as we come to 1 Peter chapter 3, understanding the overall context that a Christian wife, Peter says very clearly, is, sub is to submit even to her unbelieving husband. Now in these verses, Peter is not giving a general treatise on marriage, but is dealing with a specific situation where a Christian wife is married to an unbelieving husband. Presumably the wife came to the Lord after they were married. Christian is, scripture is very clear that we are to marry in the Lord. That is, if you're single and you're dating, don't date someone who's an unbeliever. Don't even start that because it's important, if you're going to get God's blessing, that you marry a believer, that you are both under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. What a great way to begin marriage. Now, in the first century, wives automatically assumed the religion of their husbands. A pagan husband worshiping false idols, false gods, expected his wife to worship his idols. So here is an unbelieving man. He is his own religion. The Romans and the Greeks had their pantheon of gods, and uh, he's married to this Christian woman. Notice what Peter does not do. He doesn't instruct the Christian wife to leave the unbelieving husband. That might be your first thought. He doesn't do that. He doesn't tell the Christian wife to abandon her faith, but rather Christian wives married to unbelieving husbands <clears throat> are to continue in their marriage. <clears throat> so that's the overall context of submission. Now secondly, <clears throat> what's the meaning of submission? What does it mean to be in submission? Submission is the way of life for every Christian, not just women. This term, be subject, that we see in verse 1, is used frequently by Peter. And he says, likewise, notice how chapter 3 begins, likewise, that connects with the previous chapter, previous verses, where he's talking about being subject. This term, being subject, was used of our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke tells us he was subject <coughs> to his parents. As a boy, as a young man, he was subject to his parents. The demons were subject to the disciples. Citizens are subject to the government, Paul says in Romans 13, verse 1. The universe is subject to Christ, 1 Corinthians 15. Church members are subject to church leaders, Hebrews 13, verse 17. Servants are subject to their masters, Titus 1, verse 9. It's the same word throughout. Now, wives are to be subject to their own husbands. Paul says in Ephesians 5, just as the church is subject to Christ, so the wife is to be subject to her husband. Now, I realize <clears throat> this term, this concept of being submission to some people is demeaning, very negative, unacceptable, particularly in this advanced society that may have been true 2,000 years ago, but you can't expect wives to be subject to their husbands today. Well, this Greek word 
subject, hypotasso, occurs in chapter 2, verse 13, we saw, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. It's used in verse 18 of chapter 2, servants, be subject to your masters. Now it's used in chapter 3, verse 1, wives, be subject to your own husband. It's used in chapter 5, verse 5, likewise you who are younger, be subject to the elders. You know, this is the overall context, that every Christian in different relationships is to manifest submission, respect. So now in the home, he's dealt with society. He's dealt with the workplace. Now in the home, a wife is to be subject to her husband. After all, she's a suitable helper to him. We saw that in Genesis 2 verse 18. Here is Adam. He's alone. He's a perfect man. But in some way, he's incomplete. And so this wife, Eve, comes to him and supplements him, complements him, so that the two can be stronger and better than one. Nowhere in the New Testament does this word, subject, hypotasso in Greek, nowhere does it mean inferiority. When our Lord Jesus Christ was on earth, he was subject to his Father. He said, I've come not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Was Jesus on earth inferior to his Father? Absolutely not. That's heresy. He was of the one essence. He was God. And yet in his incarnation, in his submission, in his humility, he is subject to his Father and comes to do the Father's will. Remember the great prayer in Gethsemane, not my will, but yours be done. He's praying to his Father. Our Lord was subject to his Father. Equal, that is true, no inferiority, but subject to his Father. So this subjection that Peter is talking about <clears throat> is God's order. As I say, in society, in the workplace, in the church, and in the home. You find that hard? That submission is done for the Lord's sake. It's done as an act of worship to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come to verse 1 of our text. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. Now, husbands shouldn't demand that their wives be submission. Notice it's addressed to the wives. We'll deal with the husband next week in verse 7. This submission of the wife is a voluntary surrender of her rights and her will. It's not a biblical warrant for husbands insisting that their wives obey them. I remember in the previous church being wakened up at 5 a.m. Now, if you wake me up at 5 a.m., make sure it's an emergency. In fact, my cell phone is off then. Call one of the other pastors. Because <laughs> I'm asleep at 5 a.m. And this man called, and uh, he said, I don't mind, I hope you don't mind me calling you, Pastor, at five o'clock, but I'm just beginning my work. And I thought, you know, I have not been getting my work. So what's the urgency? He said to me, do you know uh, Hebrew and Greek? I said, well, I'm not a, a scholar, but I studied Hebrew and Greek um, at seminary. I've got uh, some knowledge of it. <clears throat> and he said, well, I want you to go through all of the Bible and note the verses so that I can tell my wife to obey me. <laughs> this at 5 a.m. I said to him, brother, there is a scripture I want to tell you, and then I'm going to put down the phone. It's found in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. I said, why not practice that? And if you do that, you will need to call me again at 5 a.m. That's not what Peter is saying. Peter is addressing this to wives. Wives, I'm speaking to you. This is the voice of God to you today. Wives, if you're married, be subject to your own husbands. They're to do this not out of compulsion, but voluntarily. Just as our Lord was in submission to His Father on earth, 
in that divine order. So, Peter is giving the divine order. Now, notice the reference, Peter says, be subject to your own husband. It's not that wives generally are subject to men. That's not the point. The relationship is in view. Here is an unbelieving husband and a believing wife, and that wife is to be in submission to that husband. So, first of all, wives are to display submission to their own husband. Secondly, wives are to display godly behavior. Again, our text, likewise, wa- likewise wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even, you listening, even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. The Christian wives, godly behavior, our godly conduct will be a powerful witness to her unbelieving husband. Now, I think in the context, it seems clear, I think we can make an inference, that the Christian wife has presented the gospel to her unbelieving husband. But he does not, verse 1, he does not obey the Word. He's heard the Word, but he doesn't obey it. He's rejected the gospel. Perhaps he's even hostile to his wife, that she is a follower of Christ, and he is not. How is she to respond? Got a Christian wife. She presents the gospel uh, to her husband. He does not obey the Word, doesn't want to hear about it. Tells her to stop. What's what's she to do? She is, verse 2, to display, notice what Peter says, respectful and pure conduct. Her godly submission to this man and her irreproachable conduct will demonstrate her trust in the purposes of God. In these very difficult circumstances, this woman is to respect her husband and live a holy life. A godly wife will not try to argue her husband into believing. Husbands, Peter says, isn't this intriguing, verse 1, can be one, that is one for Christ, without a word. Christian wives don't nag. Have you learned that husbands don't like to be nagged? This wife is not to keep nagging her husband. No, she's to seek to win him, that is to lead this man to Christ, displaying her purity, displaying her respect, And that is going to be a powerful witness to her unbelieving husband. Peter is not de-emphasizing the Word of God, but he is de-emphasizing the words of the wife. The conduct of a Christian wife, I think we can understand this, the conduct of a Christian wife will be much more influential than her words. That's true of anything anyone we're witnessing to. Isn't that right? Perhaps at your home, your father, your brother, perhaps a friend, someone at work is an unbeliever. You present the gospel to them, and they reject it. What are you to do? Are you to continue to hammer and hammer and hammer at them? No. What you're to do? To display by your life, by your conduct, that they will see Christ in you. That's the point. So, first, wives are to display submission to their own husbands. Secondly, wives are to display godly behavior, conduct. And then thirdly, wives are to display true beauty. Verses 3 and 4, do not let, first a negative, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but, here it is, let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. True beauty is not external. There is the external, Peter says, but there's also the internal. There is that which is obvious. There is that on the outside that we see But the true beauty, Peter is saying, is hidden. It's 
the beauty of the heart. Now, men, I'm sure you were like me, unless you were extra, extra spiritual, but when you first see your wife, when you first meet her, your, your future wife, uh, you can't see her heart. I remember the first time I saw Goodney, she was on a ship arriving from the Faroe Islands, Scandinavia to Scotland, coming on a mission trip to convert us heathen Scotland, Scots. And there she was on the ship. I was there as a representative from the church and some others. Uh, we were going to arrange accommodation, and I saw this beautiful young lady. I didn't see her heart, but I thought, I like what I see. <laughs> that was the external. I think that's how most of us begin. You don't know the heart. And so as I began to know her, she was there for two weeks. I had two men from the missions uh, trip staying with me in my little bachelor flat. And I said to them, uh, do you know Goodney Engels' daughter Gunnarsson? It took me two days to get her name down. <laughs> and uh, one of them said, yeah, I know her a bit. And the other said, I know her quite well. I know her parents. They're part of our church. Uh, and I said, well, tell me about her. And he said, she comes from a very good family, and uh, she is a strong Christian young woman. Now, we didn't, we didn't have Google in those days. I couldn't Google her. <laughs> couldn't check her Facebook or Instagram or anything like that. What, what was I trying to do as I got to know her? Yes, I found her externally beautiful, but I was concerned about her heart. First of all, was she an authentic follower of Jesus Christ? I'd been praying for a Christian wife. God dropped her, this woman right in front of me. I liked what I saw. I began to get to know her, to find out about her heart, her character. Was she an authentic follower of Christ, or was, just, was this just a profession of her faith? What is more important, the external or the internal? Clearly, the internal. Peter contrasts the external and the hidden beauty. Now, a wife's desire, or a woman's desire to be externally beautiful, normally focuses on three things that Peter says. Did you notice them? Hair, jewelry, and clothes. Things haven't changed, have they? But beauty in these areas is not going to win the heart of the unbelieving husband. In Greek and Roman culture, there was a trend, tremendous emphasis, emphasis on the elaborate preparation of women's hair. They loved wigs. I've thought of one, but rejected it. Uh, their, their hair was often braided or uh, teared. Clement of Alexandria said that some women feared going to sleep at night as they were concerned that the design of their hair might be spoiled. <laughs> That's how important they regarded uh, their hair. Women of that day often put pieces of jewelry in their hair. They wore expensive gold rings. They were concerned with chains and necklaces and bracelets and earrings. They had an extensive wardrobe with a tremendous variety of dresses. Now, you might wonder, what about the readers that Peter was writing to? They were scattered. Most of them wouldn't have that, but perhaps some of them had accumulated some of these things. And Peter is explaining that all of this external adornment is not conducive to winning unbelieving husbands for Christ. Notice the contrast, verse 3. Do not let your adorning be external. Verse 4, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart. This word adorning is a Greek word, uh, cosmos, from which we get cosmetic. What's cosmetic? That which is external. Peter, now clearly, Peter is not prohibiting uh, a woman from taking care of their hair or wearing jewelry or clothes. Obviously, they're to wear clothes. And that's important. I think a godly woman will take care of herself and not deny her femininity. After all, the godly women of the Old Testament, such as Sarah, he's going to mention, and Rebecca, are described as very beautiful in Genesis, and they also wore jewelry. That's not the point. 
So these verses shouldn't be interpreted as a recipe for the Christian wife to look like some kind of frump. Absolutely not. I'm serious, guys, right? The point is that the beauty is not ostentatious. It's not the external adorning that God is concerned that we should be concerned. But true beauty positively impacts husbands and pleases God. Did you notice at the end of verse 4, which in God's sight is very precious? How does our society determine beauty? Isn't that interesting? What does our society say, for example, is a beautiful woman? Normally, she's got to be tall, not too small. Normally, she's got to be thin. It seems to be the thinner, the better. Uh, I don't find that attractive, but some men obviously do. She's got to be glamorous looking. Peter is saying, listen, the measure of true beauty doesn't lie in the external. True and lasting beauty is internal rather than external. It's not cosmetic. No amount of elaborate hairstyles, no amount of expensive jewelry or thick makeup or flamboyant dresses or plastic surgery can cover up an ungodly, loud, loud shallow, mean-spirited woman. Am I right? We've seen such women. They've obviously spent a lot of time before the mirror, before they got out. This is how Solomon says, Proverbs 11, verse 22, as a ring of gold in a pig's snout, so is a beautiful woman who lacks discretion. Now, that's the Word of God. I'm not saying that. <laughs> I am saying it. So here's a pig. It's got a beautiful ring on it, ring on its nose. That's like a beautiful woman, externally beautiful, but she lacks discretion. Have you met women like that? That's not the kind of woman you want to be married to, is it? No, a wife, a Christian wife, will reflect true beauty which is inside. How will she do that? Peter is telling us, by her conduct, by her respect, by her purity, by her demeanor. She will conduct herself with a quiet dignity and gentleness. That's what he says. The imperishable beauty, what is imperishable beauty? Of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. This gentleness, this elegance, a dignity of true beauty is the opposite of the pushy, loud, selfish, manipulative attitudes and conduct of some women. This beauty is imperishable. They say when you get married, you take a look at the mother and say, mm, that's what she's going to be like in several years. It's not always true, is it? But when you get married, you think, okay, I'm marrying this beautiful woman. Is that beauty going to continue as I get married? See, Peter is emphasizing not a personality type, but virtues all Christian women can demonstrate. Respect, gentleness, dignity, purity, trust, and sincerity. And a woman who is beautiful in the inside will radiate on the outside so that the unbelieving husband will see that God is working through the life of this woman, that she is displaying the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. She's not nagging him every time she meets him. She's not presenting the gospel to him and, and trying to get him to come to church and on and on and on. No. Instead, he's going to look at her as she grows in the Lord, as she displays Christ. He's going to look on that imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. Can I speak to the girls here? 
I'm going to speak to the young women. I'm going to speak to the wives. Pursue this imperishable beauty. Do you take a lot of time with the external? Are you cultivating the internal? Are you walking with Christ? Are you looking at Christ? Because the more you look at Christ, the more you read of Him, the more you commune with Him, the more you see Christ in action in the Gospels. And as you read about the doctrine of Christ in the epistles, there is an amazing thing happening that you are being transformed so that you're becoming more and more like Christ and reflecting His gentleness. Remember, the Lord says in one of His few self-descriptions, I am gentle in spirit. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest, for I am gentle. Think of the gentleness of the Lord. Think of His strength. Think of His righteousness. Think of His truth. But the strength of this imperishable beauty. Now, there's one more before we tie this up. Wives are to trust in God and respect their husbands. You are to trust in God and respect your husband. Verse 6. Sorry, verse 5. Peter's going to give an example. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. Same word. Here it is. How did you adorn, adorn themselves? By submitting to their own husbands. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Christian wives trust in God. The holy women in the Old Testament, Peter is saying in verse 5, they hoped in God. That has the same force. They believed in God. They trusted in God. They believed the promises of God. They claimed the promises of God. Their hope was not in this world. Their hope was in God. Even in difficult circumstances, even in very dangerous circumstances, as you, as you read the Old Testament, these godly women were trusting in God. And Christian wives demonstrate their hope in God, their trust in God, by acknowledging the divine pattern, the, acknowledging the divine order, and graciously submitting to their husbands. Wives will demonstrate their trust in God then by pursuing an internal beauty rather than the external one. Their internal beauty is going to be vastly more important than the external. A Christian wife who is hoping in God Peter is telling us, will adorn herself with the jewels of a gentle and quiet spirit and demonstrate that by submitting to her husband, her own husband. Amen. Christian wives provide positive models of trust and respect, and that is true beauty. Who are today's models for women? Who do, who do young women, and even older women, look to as the model of beauty? Who shapes the styles of women's appearances, their attitudes, their beauty, their hairstyles, what they wear? Largely, isn't it true, the glamorous celebrity women of Hollywood, the so-called celebrity, the, the singer, the actress, the models who appear on the covers of the glossary of the glossy magazines or on social media. They're the models. And thousands, if not millions, look at them and copy them. You see that when some celebrity wears a certain wedding dress. The stores take that model and people buy it. Now, Christian women will not follow these models, many of whom are shallow and immoral. What models should a young woman follow? A young woman should follow the model of older women. Yes, if you're a young woman, get to know some of the older women at Calvary. That's what Peter's doing. He's given the example of a holy woman, Sarah. Now, if you read about Sarah, physically she was a very beautiful woman. But Peter presents her not, of, not as an example of external beauty, 
but of a spiritual model of godliness and of submission, of respect, of true beauty. She hoped in God. She's in the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, uh, where it says in verse 11 that she considered God faithful who had promised, and she obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. When she heard uh, of the promise of a son, you remember the men coming and in, in Genesis 18, and at long last there is the promise of a son, and she addresses Abraham as Lord. Now, Peter is not saying that Christian wives all are to call their husbands Lord. No, this was a conventional term in that culture showing respect. In fact, as the men come to Abraham's tent in Hebrews in, in Genesis 18, he refers to them as Lord, my Lord. It was a term of respect. What's the point? Sarah is showing a respect for her husband by calling him Lord. She showed respect to Abraham in accordance with the culture and the custom of that day. And it is very important, Paul is going to say this in Ephesians 5, that wives respect their husbands. That is very important. Let me say to a young woman who's dating someone, even contemplating marriage, do not marry anyone that you do not respect. It is very, very important for a successful marriage that the wife respect her husband. And wives, demonstrate your respect for your husband. You don't always agree with them, that is true, but you are to show respect for them. It is very, very hard for a husband, and I've spoken to many over the years, when they come and say, my wife no longer respects me. It is very important that you demonstrate your respect for your husband. And Sarah demonstrates her hope in God and her submission to Abraham in many ways. Think of Sarah being married to Abraham. They're in Ur of the Chaldeans. He's a wealthy man. But God says to Abraham, no, I want you to go to a country you don't know. And he goes. Who's with him? His wife, Sarah. She's following his leadership. We're in the promised land. There's a famine, and Abraham decides to go to Egypt. Not the wisest thing, but Sarah goes with him. She's showing her respect for her husband. Then think of it when Abraham comes and says that he's going to sacrifice their son, the son of promise, the one through whom God is going to fulfill his covenant. And Abraham says, now, God sold me. I've got to go to the mountain of Moriah and offer my son as a sacrifice, our son. Imagine what the wife would say. And Sarah clearly doesn't tell us in the text in Genesis, but clearly she showed her respect. Her hope was in God. Her trust was in God. And women who follow Sarah's example of submission and respect for their husband are known as Verse 6, Sarah's daughters, you are her children. Such women will do good, even in difficult and dangerous circumstances. If you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Sarah had, uh, humanly speaking, frightening experiences, but her trust was in God, and her respect was, her, was in her husband. And her obedience to God and her respect for her husband produced no fear. And so here is this unbelieving uh, man married to this believing woman that Peter is talking about, and he's saying to this woman, if you do what I'm say telling you, if you submit to your husband, if you demonstrate this true beauty with your purity of conduct and your respect, there's nothing to fear. Isn't that wonderful to go through life? Isn't it wonderful when a wife respects her husband. I remember many years now going to Goodney and saying, God is calling me to leave my law practice and to, to go into full-time ministry. And by the way, uh, I'm going to study at Dallas Theological Seminary in Texas, the United States, where I've never been. And Goodney did not immediately say, hallelujah, that's what I've been waiting to hear. 
She was still learning English, getting accustomed to the wonderful Scottish culture, couldn't embrace all of it, but she was learning. And now I was saying that God was leading me to another country, a different career as it were. And I said, just pray about it. She said, I don't want to pray about it. I said, pray about it. If God is calling me, He will give you that peace and that understanding and that calling that this is what we're going to do, that we're going to go forward and trust God. And that's what happens. And since that day, Goodney has never said to me once what a silly decision that was. In fact, over the years, when I've got, come home very frustrated with different things in the church and with different individuals and different circumstances and said, I'm going, to, I'm going to get out of this, I'm tired of this, she has said many times to me, didn't God call you? And then we thought we're going to go back to Scotland. God called us to Pittsburgh. One of my professors said, Pittsburgh? And we went to Pittsburgh. And then we went to Canada, Nova Scotia. Then we went to Michigan. And now we come here. And in each step, Goodney has been by my side. In each step, I have taken the initiative. I have felt that this is what God has called us to do. And in every year, circumstance, Goodney has shown her respect, her hope in God, her love for me, in saying that we will go forward together. I praise God for such a wife as he gave me. Peter is reminding us then that living for Christ can be difficult. There are dangerous circumstances. And as we follow the Word of God, it does not mean that we're immune from suffering and difficulties. Perhaps you are a believing wife married to an unbelieving husband. That's difficult. Perhaps your husband is a believer, but he's not strong in his faith, and your marriage continues to be difficult. What are you to do? You're to follow the Word of God. You're to demonstrate by your conduct, by your purity, by your respect for Him, and you will display to Him the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. We as Christians are to conduct ourselves with respect. We're to follow the divinely instituted order for the Lord's sake. We're to trust God in difficult circumstances. We are in all circumstances continuing to display Jesus Christ. We're not to despair. We're not to expect everything to go smoothly because we're following, the, because we're following Christ. We're not to nag people. We're not to manipulate people into making a profession of salvation. No, by a respectful attitude, by our holy conduct, by displaying the Lord Jesus Christ. Our homes, our workplace, society will be transformed as we live for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the word today to wives. Wives, think it over. Discuss it with your husbands. Pray about it. And it's wonderful at Calvary, I must say, to see so many wives that are sold out for Jesus Christ, that they're by their husband's side, and they're serving God with devotion and with respect. Let me pray. And as we bow, let me pray particularly for our wives, for our girls, for our sisters in Christ, whether they're married or single, that they will display Christ. Our Father and our God, we read this text, and in some ways it's difficult for us, but we thank You for its clarity. We thank You for the example of godly women. We thank You for the example of godly women here at Calvary, that even as they get older externally, they become more and more beautiful as they display Christ. And I thank You for our godly sisters in Christ at Calvary. We pray for our girls here that they truly will not look to the world for models of beauty, but rather will look to their mothers, to other women who are radiating Christ. Uh, we pray for our single sisters. Some of them are contented in their singleness. Others are looking for a Christian husband. Father, I pray 
for them. Help them never to lower their standards, but to stand strong on the Word of God. And may our homes reflect the beauty of our Lord Jesus Christ, that those who come into our homes will sense that this home is centered on Jesus Christ. That is our prayer. Help us, our Father, we need it. And may the love that you give us flow through us to others. In Christ's name, amen.